Morning, everyone. We're just going to wait one or two minutes for all the folks to come in. So I appreciate your patience, especially on this Monday morning. Still have some folks just connecting, so hold on one bit. All right, I think we are good to go. We've got a good crowd this morning, so I appreciate everyone joining us here for the New England Council's Financial Services Committee meeting. Uh, as many of you know, the council is entering a very busy season for ourselves. Um, and this week, we actually have Congressman John Larson in Washington, D.C. this Wednesday on March 27th. We're hosting, or excuse me, uh, Putnam Investments is hosting a New England Council event that will host over 30 foreign ambassadors from five different uh, continents. So that should be a good one. On April 4th, we'll be in Rhode Island hosting a breakfast with Senator Jack Reed. April 5th, we have breakfast with New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. And obviously in May, we'll be hosting our big annual Washington DC fly-in for three days of events, meetings, and our famous Capitol Hill reception. Um, but today uh, we are meeting to discuss the recent developments or uh, situation in the national and international banking industry. We're very fortunate to have two expert panelists, uh, Mr. Gra excuse me, Brian Gardner from Stifel, who's down in Washington, DC. Uh, Brian uh, does this regularly for CNBC, Fox Business and Bloomberg. And he previously worked on the Hill for some time. And Mr. Chris Smith, uh, the president of Summit Global Strategies, who was previously a chief of staff at the U.S. Treasury Department during the Bush administration, Bush administration and worked on the Hill for 12 years for uh, the Ways and Means Committee and other various members. So we're very fortunate to get their insight on these uh, issues that we're dealing with, whether it's going to be a uh, response from the administration uh, or policy changes in Congress, um, but also we'll be talking about maybe the next steps uh, that they believe could be coming for the banking industry or the financial services industry as a whole. So to get us started, I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, nice introduction and, and great to be here with the New England Council and, it, and it's March Madness um, for many people. And uh, it's turning out, um, out to be a lot like my Chartwell uh, NCAA bracket, um, moving in the wrong direction. Uh, Credit Suisse was just the weekend's big upset pick. And then the post Silicon Valley Bank blame game, getting some better understanding is at a real premium. So this uh, event couldn't couldn't be coming at a better time. With that in mind, um, let me go through my 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 brackets in terms of what I see going going on and how we got here. The returning champion, uh, behind all this, of course, is inflation. It flared up in 2020 as Congress poured yet more fiscal stimulus into a supply-constrained economy. The Fed didn't react to that until a year later, holding rates too low too long in the meantime. Now the hurry-up tightening cycle has put unprecedented stress on the financial system. <clears throat> Out in the Midwest region, we uh, are informed by Warren Buffett's famous quip about what happens when the liquidity tide goes out. It exposes everything that was lurking under the water. And it was an inevitable that higher interest rates would eventually start to squeeze the weaker links in the financial system. <clears throat> out in the Western region, 
it looks like there were plenty of fouls, um, both called and not called. While the frontline regulators had been warning Silicon Valley about problems, it still wasn't enough to prevent failure. <clears throat> the bank still didn't fix them. Why, we don't know yet, and a great deal of time will be spent figuring that out. <clears throat> worse, management reportedly made the concentration of risk even worse with lending clauses that tied the hands of their depositors uh, to the bank. Back here in the Northeast region, the most popular pick is weak regulation. Even so, we shouldn't forget that it was Congress who created the regulatory structure after the global financial crisis, which focused more on capital than on other things like deposit concentration or interest rate risk and deemed long dated treasuries as always and everywhere safe. Randy Quarles, my former colleague at, uh, back at the Treasury, has pointed out that the changes the Fed made to bank regulations during his tenure were mainly around stress testing capital and not the issues that came up at SVB. Finally, in this region, with even a former banking chairman coaching from the board bench of, of the, board, the bank board, we saw that crypto and the banking system didn't mix well. So what are the picks for the next round of March Madness? The uh, Open Market Committee at the Fed is meeting this week. A lot can still happen between, between now and then, but we'll see if the Fed can channel F. Scott Fitzgerald's famous saying about holding two diametrically opposed ideas, financial, price stability, in their mind at the same time. <clears throat> and retain the ability to function. Both the Fed and the ECB are arguing that they can walk and chew gum at the same time. We'll see. There's a big risk lurking on both sides. <clears throat> a big argument for a pause in the rate hike cycle is that the rapid tightening in market conditions is already equivalent to around another 25 or 50 basis point rate hike at least according to Goldman and other uh, estimators. On the other hand, with inflation still at 6%, which is three times the target, and the Fed funds rate still at four, which means real rates are negative, there's more to be done on inflation. So the Fed's getting caught from both sides. There are other arguments for the Fed not to pause this week. It would be very hard to restart rate hikes again if they did. A pause could signal that the Fed knows more about distress than it's been letting on. And it could also show that the interventions so far haven't gone far enough. In the face of continued deposit migration from smaller to bigger banks, up on Capitol Hill, there's a potential stampede forming to raise the deposit limit with various proposals being floated. We saw one from the mid-sized banks over the weekend. The question is, what conditions would come with it and of course, who's going to pay? Will a rollback of S2155 be a price? Here in New England, I got a prompt notice from the Cape Cod Five Bank saying that all deposits over 250000 were already covered by the depositors insurance fund, just like the rest of Massachusetts depositors. I didn't even know that. So requiring something like that on excess deposits just like we require PMI on riskier mortgages, it could be a way to help maintain some form of market discipline rather than a government takeover of insurance deposit, uh, uh, deposit insurance. The bottom line, just like during the global financial crisis, the fog of war and the information asymmetry didn't clear up until stress tests had, had occurred across the system. Now, it could take that again. Of course, what to test for is the big question. The deeper we get into March Madness, no doubt there will be more upsets coming. And thinking further ahead, the current turmoil adds more pressure on Congress and the Biden administration to find a smoother resolution of the debt limit issue looming later this summer. So we'll see what happens. Thanks again for listening. 
All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, so this is Brian Gardner. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, just a quick disclaimer. Um, these events, so you know, I'm not a regulator, but uh, disclaimers are always the uh, uh, the best way to start out. Um, my comments are uh, for informational purposes only and are not an offer or solicitation to purchase or sell any security or instrument um, or to participate in any uh, trading strategy, nor do they constitute investment advice. These are my personal opinions. Uh, I do not speak for Stiefel Management or any part of the firm, including uh, Keith Brouette and Woods, KBW, and my comments might differ from those uh, of other uh, from other departments of the firm. And I should mention, since since Chris mentioned the uh, Midsize Bank Coalition, uh, Stiefel is a member. Uh, uh, Stiefel Bank is a member of of the Midsize Bank Coalition, I, and I don't speak for it for the, uh, the the coalition as well. So um, you know, Chris was talking a little bit on on how we got here. Um, and spending a lot of time on the inflationary side, um, this is also a supervisory failure um, at its core. Um, uh, in addition to the inflation um, uh, 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 contributing factor, um, but Silicon Valley's balance sheet tripled over the course of four years, and bank supervision and bank examination—that's that's course one hundred one. Um, anytime you see a ballooning. In the balance sheet, it should raise all sorts of red flags. And some press reports have indicated that early on those red flags were were being raised, but there was no follow through or insufficient follow through and action on those. Of course, um, I think many of you have seen that uh, the fact that uh, Silicon Valley was without a chief risk officer for several months, um, which is an, uh, another problem. Um, on the uh, signature New York uh, uh, side, um, you had a, a pivot in business strategy. Um, it was a fairly sleepy commercial real estate lender in the New York area and pivoted to crypto several years ago. And that pivot um, uh, into a new strategy has caused problems. So these are things that I think regulators, policymakers, lawmakers are all going to look at um, because they inform the decision of what to do next. Um, since um, uh, Chris mentioned the, the Mid-Size Bank Coalition uh, letter, um, there is a call for at least temporary unlimited deposit insurance, a year, two years. Um, th there is, and there is a consensus in, uh, that I have picked up in my conversations with bank investors and banks um, uh, that something is needed uh, to, to stabilize the system. Um, but it's not easy to get there. Um, uh, I, I, in my opinion, uh, Congress would have to approve any increase. Um, there is some pushback to that view. I will acknowledge that the FDIC uh, currently has that authority. I disagree with that uh, that that view. Um, people look back to the the 20, uh, 2008 uh, Great Financial Crisis and look at the temporary account. Guarantee program that the FDIC set up, as well as the debt guarantee program, those two issue, those two programs relied on a systemic risk exception, uh, which is in the statute and something that the the regulators pointed to uh, in their support for uninsured deposits at both Silicon Valley and Signature. However, um, in Dodd Frank, you know, that authority was uh, materially reduced. Um, uh, the, the FDIC has written um, that it cannot stand up a, a new uh, a temporary account guarantee program. Uh, that's their own admission from the changes that were in Dodd-Frank. On the debt guarantee program, uh, this shows how, how high the hurdles are, although it technically can be recreated, um, even if you think that a debt guarantee program could help in this situation, and I, I, I'm skeptical about that. It, it, it's it's the wrong solution for this pro particular problem. Uh, you the, the the regulators have to jump through a number of hoops, having the FDIC's board, the Fed's board, all on the same page, in consult uh, uh, along with Treasury, who has to consult the president, and then Congress actually has the uh, ability to intervene. Um, there, there's a mechanism for Congress to vote on that. So it it really does come down at the end of the day. Um, to Congress approving um, some kind of measure. Uh, this is kind of an important week um, in terms of the path forward. Um, 
and let me kind of talk about if I'm wrong and Congress can and it does decide to create some kind of temporary uh, guarantee for uninsured deposits. Um, so I'll be looking this week, the, the American Bankers Association has its Washington summit. Uh, uh, Secretary Yellen uh, will be speaking. Some key lawmakers on Capitol Hill will be speaking. The, the, the two chairmen of the relevant committees, Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services, and their counterparts, their ranking members will both uh, will also be speaking. Um, we could get some clues uh, about the path forward. I don't think they'll announce specific steps forward. Um, House Republicans are having a retreat as we speak in Orlando, Florida. Um, and I, I think it's going to be interesting to kind of get intel afterwards to see where House Republicans are, because they have been leaning in this, in a populist direction, um, where if they if they support an increase in deposit insurance, and I'm skeptical on this because it's it would in fact be guaranteeing the deposits of what it will be painted as very wealthy uh, depositors. Um, uh, that that's not going to play well um, in in some constituencies. Um, I would be spending a lot of time um, focusing on. Um, uh, let me just mention a couple members I would I would focus on. Uh, so House Financial Services Committee Chairman Patrick McHenry. Uh, McHenry voted against the original TARP legislation back in 2008, but he has evolved into a very serious lawmaker. He's a close ally of Speaker McCarthy. And so I, I think in any pathway forward, uh, he is a key player. Obviously, on the Senate side, Elizabeth Warren is, is always involved, um, and I would be focused on her. There are a handful of Republican senators, um, freshmen, in, in fact, that I would pay attention to because they represent this populist wave um, among Republicans. Uh, I'll just point out one, uh, Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio, who is a member of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, he's been engaged in the uh, train wreck in Ohio um, and is collaborating with Democrats on some policy solutions in ways that a typical Republican might not be expected to be. So, he kind of represents a new direction for Republicans. And um, if there's going to be any kind of temporary guarantee, um, I think Vance will be involved in order to craft what the what the rest of the package looks like. Um, should also point out that on March 29th, the House Financial Services Committee is going to have a hearing with with uh, FDIC Vice Chairman for Supervision Michael Barr, FD, uh, I'm sorry, Federal Reserve Board uh, Vice Chairman uh, Michael Barr, FDIC Chairman uh, Martin Grunberg. It's tough to see Congress acting before that hearing. Um, for the very reason I kind of cited earlier, Congress not going to act until they have a better sense of what exactly happened. So a proper solution can be applied to the situation. And if I'm right on that, and you get to March 29th, well, Congress then leaves town for two weeks for the Passover and Easter recess. So you're not, investors and banks should not be expecting congressional action really till mid-April uh, at the earliest. And for those who say, well, you know, this is a, this is a crisis situation that it needs immediate, an immediate response, I would point back to the great financial crisis, uh, financial crisis 2008, when you had Lehman going down on September 15th. Right afterwards, AIG was bailed out. On the 18th of September, uh, S uh, Secretary Paulson and uh, uh, Chair Fed Chairman Bernanke met with congressional leaders to spell out the cataclysm that they were facing. And still in the face of that, Congress did not vote. The, the House originally rejected TARP on October 1 and reversed itself on October 3. And the liquidity programs were stood up in the middle of October. So anybody who was, and you contrast that when you had the two chief economic regulators, um, overseers of the economy, advising Congress that the entire financial system and the entire economy was on the verge of collapse. And it took Congress a couple of weeks to act. Now, the Secretary of the Treasury is saying that the banking system is resilient and strong and the economy is strong. That's not a message to leap into action. So for those who are expecting quick action, I would temper um, those expectations. What would happen if, if they do act on deposit insurance? 
Chris mentioned the repeal of S-2155. Elizabeth Warren has already suggested that and proposed that in legislation. It's a, it's a very short bill. It's just repeal 2155. But I think once the process starts, it's tough to control. And you could see additional um, uh, amendments, additional proposals being floated. Um, uh, further restrictions on executive compensation. Um, tougher clawback provisions. I would even go far as floating something, um, potentially I could see being floated um, as some kind of cap on return on equity for shareholders. Because after all, if you're going to, if the government is going to guarantee an enormous portion of a bank's liabilities, why do shareholders have the potential for unlimited returns? So there's going to be a lot of tension there. Um, there's international fallout. Um, European regulators have been highly critical of the U.S. response after being lectured to on bailouts and 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 restraint from government agencies. Um, the Europeans, I think, are very frustrated with the way that Silicon Valley and Signature uh, were handled. Um, and then we'll we'll get the uh, a, a quick response from from regulators. Uh, one on the supervisory side, as I mentioned before, this is a supervisory failure. I think supervisors, bank examiners, will pivot quickly. There will be an attitude among bank examiners, not on my watch. Um, they're not going to be the, the next one to make a similar Silicon Valley mistake. And then there will be a series of regulatory changes, some of which were already starting um, to go get uh, get ready to go through this, the, the public comment uh, uh, process prior to Silicon Valley. But um, uh, changes in TLAC, TLAC requirements, uh, pushing them further down. Uh, uh, to uh, smaller institutions, um, taking away the opt-out for some of those larger regional banks uh, to opt out of uh, uh, AOCI uh, treatment uh, for their for their balance sheets. Um, uh, there, there's already a capital review uh, underway uh, at the Federal Reserve announced by Vice Chairman Barr. You'll see others, and and of course, I, I think this also leads to changes in the bank merger rules, which again have been floated, not formally proposed, but the regulators have been talking about those for um, the better part of eighteen months. And interestingly enough, in the context of large regional bank failures, so um, there's going to be a lot of action on the regulatory side going forward. And I probably have gone way over that five minutes, but uh, let me throw it back to you, Griffin, and, and open up for questions. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. That was uh, exactly what we were looking for. So I appreciate all that insight. Uh, we are opening it to questions. Um, I can lead off. Um, you know, you've seen some of the larger financial <laughs> institutions step up and help their fellow uh, banks in these tough situations. Do you think that is something we'll continue to see if this process continues to go down? Um, or will the government step up before then? It's If you could talk about how those decisions are made, uh, if there's conversations between uh, the administration and these larger institutions, um, it'd be great to hear about that. Well, as Brian pointed out, um, there's still a, a stigma on bailouts. And uh, we saw, you know, with the, the European backlash, and I think that's why the Swiss went to greater lengths to, I think, at least give it the patina of a... Uh, of a merger rather than you know just an outright bailout i think you you can quibble about about that when you look at where the capital's coming from for this deal but um i think there will be a premium on on orchestrating as we as we saw um recently with with the most recent you know sort of capital injections um there'll be a premium on avoiding government um takeovers "Quote unquote bailouts and exhausting all other um, all other methods um, through orchestration behind the scenes." Brian, I know, Brian, what do you think? Um, you know, uh, it, it was done in, in in the context of First Republic, um, and th that that in of itself is a unique franchise because it's such a high um, high net worth um, client base, which is very attractive <clears throat> to a number of institutions and. For any institution that um, might be interested in in purchasing First Republic down the road, hypothetically, um, you know, is kind of in their interest to uh, to stabilize the situation at, at First Republic and also give the regulators a little more time to breathe. Um, 
if that can be reconstituted again, I'm not so sure. My, my colleagues over at KBW put out an interesting note over the weekend. There, there is an interbank um, insurance lending function um, uh, that, I, to be honest with you, I was not aware of until over the weekend um, when when our, our research team at KBW um, started working on it. And I, I saw a number on, on social media, a number of community banks uh, refer to it. Um, I don't know how effective it is for larger institutions. It may be for true community banks, and I'm talking asset size definitely below ten billion dollars. Um, but it does it 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 does give the banks the ability um, to kind of help each other out. And I won't go into the details because I'm not an expert in the program. But um, if you do have a, a relationship with with KBW, I, I would encourage you to, to reach out to your KBW rep and get a, a copy of that report that came out last night. Um, uh, it, it, it's not getting a lot of attention and it may be more effective for smaller institutions, but it's another kind of um, uh, uh, mutual assistance uh, program within the banking industry. Appreciate that. If anyone else has any questions, uh, you can ask them in the chat privately or you can raise your hand. Um, my next question is more about the fallout over the next two years as we go into the election cycle. Um, obviously, I think based on if you looked at uh, the press release and the House Financial Services announcement about the upcoming hearing, there seemed to be some sort of bipartisan agreement that something has to be done. Uh, but how do you see Republicans and Democrats either working together or blaming each other as we go into the election um, and how that might impact the outcome of the election well i mean keep in mind the the response um to the financial the great financial crisis came just weeks before a presidential election um so in crisis situations depending on the level of severity of the crisis it is possible um to act in a bipartisan way but as i alluded to before you know this crisis in its current in, in the current status pales in comparison to 2008. Um, and so with that lack of pressure to act bipartisanly, it, it, it does complicate um, things. Uh, so um, bipartisanship may work for a little while, but it, it, it will have certain bumps along the road. Um, in terms of the election, since you mentioned it, um, part of the question, um, I think there are risks for all parties involved. Um, certainly, so if you look at it from an economic standpoint, um, the, the current crisis is is likely to lead to um, uh, constraints on credit, which will slow the economy. Um, and if the economy between the reacts between the uh, any kind of tightening of credit and the rate hikes that we have seen from the Fed over the last year or so, if that is a double whammy and starts to have real economic impact, it's at a very bad time um, for the incumbent president going for re-election in, in, um, in 2024. Um, but it, it may not be limited just to President Biden. It depends kind of how the crisis evolves. If, this, if the crisis grows and is not contained um, it could fuel a um, anti-incumbent um, wave in, in 2024 that hits both parties. Just kind of a throw the bums out, don't care who it is. So um, uh, I think there are more risks for the administration because uh, an incumbent president always bears the risk of the state of the economy. Um, but that's not to say that there are not risks for both sides, because um, if, if this does worsen, um, you could see voters turn on both sides. I, would, I agree with that entirely. I would just add that, um, you know, the odds of the hard landing um, have have shot up. <clears throat> you know, there was talk of, you know, this no landing or soft landing potential. And um, for the reasons Brian stated, um, the tightening in financial conditions, probably enough on its own to push this over the edge. But um, the certainly the incumbent president, you know, faces, you know, the trifecta, which you don't want to face going into an election cycle, which is inflation still being too high, which is still the number one issue for, for voters, um, a recession, and the potential of being 
associated with uh, bailouts. Uh, if more needs to be done, if depending on what legislation uh, might make its way through, if it can be portrayed by um, opponents as you know yet more government bailouts, which would be my my guess uh, of uh, where re Republican opponents will go. Um, that's that's really hard to uh, that's really hard to um, to run on, and the stigma from two thousand and eight is still quite palpable, and um, and so the potential for you know we've got to get through this fog of war, but then the politics will rear its head, and there'll be backlash. So um, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a roller coaster. You know, and, and Griff, maybe this would be a, a good time to circle back on this because I, because since I mentioned how the the crisis evolves, it, it it may we don't know how how this will play out. We don't know if yet if government actions are enough to stabilize the banking system from the current situation of um, of asset liability mismatches and and what that means for uh, some of the regional banks, especially and leading to deposit runs. But there are also other risks um, in the banking sector, a, a number of things that were where the seeds were planted um, during the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And uh, you know, I'll just point out again, um, a, a KBW report that came out a couple of weeks ago, which is a cross-sector analysis of a downturn in commercial real estate. And so again, I, I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, it's a March 7th report. If you have a, a relationship with KBW, I, it's definitely worth a read. It, it's a, it's an in-depth analysis of of um, uh, of what um, what we're expecting on the commercial real estate side, which would impact regional banks and smaller um, uh, in particular. Um, and if, if that, depending on the timing of that, um, you know, on how the situation in commercial commercial real estate evolves. Um, that is a risk for policymakers that and 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 politicians that maybe the the, the current uh, the current uh, responses uh, that we saw a week ago um, they stabilize the system um, for now, but there's always more risk on the other side. It, you know, there, there are a number of risks that policymakers are are facing as we as we go along here. All right, we got two questions that just came through. Uh, the first is, what is the likelihood that regulators and other financial services sectors beyond banking use this opportunity to expand their oversight powers and reach? I mean, we've already seen just an incredibly aggressive regulatory stance across the board in the Biden administration. Um, the um, American Action Forum, a think tank here in Washington, um, has something they call the regulation rodeo and they 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 keep track of the uh, economic impact of all the proposed regulations and and it, it's it's just a, a step a step function change uh under the current administration even um uh compared to the uh, during the obama administration and and the post dot frank era um so the, you know the sec i think i would single out as is one um you know financial they are a financial regulator that has a, a broad and expansive set agenda out there uh ESG and other areas um with big impact so um you know you never let a crisis go to waste so um you know the the danger here is um I think one of the questions after the 08 crisis was how much did um, the regulatory uh, backlash contribute to the slow recovery uh, in that era. Um, some would argue it, it had a lot to do with it. Um, here, um, with a potential stagflation scenario uh, on the other side of hopefully what will be a short financial interruption, um, there's got to be real concerns about going too far um, and, 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 and slamming on the brakes even harder. So this is, um, you know, things that the regulators are going to have to watch out for. You know, in in, in terms, in trying to answer that question, I'm thinking, you know, in terms of what more regulators could propose. Um, and certainly, there are always turf battles where a regulator is trying to expand uh, their jurisdiction, and, and there will be some of that. 
But I think the most important takeaway, especially in the banking sector, um, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, and even though this is not a consumer protection issue, I'll, I'll throw the CFPB in there as well. It emboldens regulators to continue on the path that they have already set out. Chris, Chris mentioned it very well, how what, what the administration has already set um, as its agenda. Um, and now I think regulators are um, Michael Barr at the Fed, um, Michael Sue at the OCC, Marty Grunberg at FDSC. I, I think they're going to feel like they have a wind at their back. Um, and it undercuts the credibility of industry to come in and lobby against cer certain regulatory changes. Um, it, it's just a, it's a sentiment shift um, that uh, that I think is going to, to help the administration um, finish up its, what it's already proposed out there. And again, we, we, we don't have formal rules on new capital requirements for banks, um, but, but the regulators have been working on a Basel III endgame. Barr mentioned this comprehensive capital review liquidity rules that are in place. This is, you know, this is a, a post Dodd Frank effort, and it's it's kind of the first time we formalized liquidity requirements. They they were done more at a supervisory level. Probably a good time to to review those as well, since it's the first take on on liquidity. Um, and, and of course, like I, I mentioned before, the the bank merger rules. Um, uh, those regulators are going to definitely feel emboldened to uh, proceed with with their agenda, what they've already laid out. All right, we have one more question. <clears throat> um, what are your thoughts on the new federal bank term funding program that is set up to assist banks? Uh, how might you, how long might you see this going for? And are, do you think any other limits would be proposed? And so on which institutions? I think it's a good program. I mean, it, we've already seen it be utilized last week. Um, and I assume this is referring to the, uh, the bank term lending facility that was announced uh, a week ago Sunday um, by uh, by the Fed under its 13-3 authority. Um, the HH, H8 data that came out Thursday night showed that um, it um, it was already um, being accessed by a number of banks. It uh, you know it's it's more advantageous than the discount window. Um, the loans are at par. Um, it it buys banks time to use this liquidity to to right size their balance sheet. Um, uh, so I, I think it can be effective. Um, uh, only time will tell. Um, uh, in terms of restrictions, um, you can't rule them out. I, I don't think that the I'm I'm skeptical that the Fed would come in and change the terms, but I wouldn't rule out Congress coming in. And you know if if. If Congress goes down the path of doing a deposit insurance bill, you open up the door to a whole host of other policy proposals. We mentioned the regulatory response that could go along. Um, but if you think back to 2009, following the TARP legislation being passed in 2008, during the first months of the Obama administration, the administration passed the stimulus bill, which changed the rules of TARP. Uh, on executive compensation and other on other provisions. So um, there's precedent for Congress intervening um, and changing the rules. So I wouldn't rule it out. I think it's a low probability, um, low probability because I think that um, at least in the near, near term, um, unlimited deposit insurance, whether it's temporary or permanent is low probability. But once you go down that road, um, uh, that is a tough process to control. And uh, and so I, I, I just kind of point that out as a possible risk. I would just also mention, um, you know, the surge we saw in the in the in going to the discount window. Um, it, it's just a, a, a real. It's reversed in terms of the Fed's balance sheet. It's entirely reversed all the all the QT that that the Fed had had engaged in. So um, you know, again, from a macro perspective. Um, you know, just a real question in terms of what the impact that surge in the um, in the discount window uh, is is going to mean um, for that program as well. All right, we had a follow up on that question. Any concerns around moral hazard? Could regulators be censured by Congress for intervening by setting up this program? <laughs> I mean, this is uh, you know you sort of go back to the to the Tim Geithner line about. Uh, you know, 
saving the arsonist in order to put out the fire. Um, and, and just the rapidity with which it happened again, this time, just 15 years later, when <clears throat> too big to fail was, you know, was supposed to be over with and an institution, I mean, these are significant institutions, but not anywhere near the too big to fail. Anybody thought the too big to fail category was, and here, um, you know, just a complete um, intervention on behalf of, of depositors. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see if there's going to be, you know, any civil money to monetary penalties on the bank management or what, what, what other shoes are going to fall in terms of the, as Brian was talking about the, the supervisors or, or lack thereof, but, um, it's, it's almost the clinic in more in moral hazard. And, um, now with calls for, you know, unlimited, um, deposit insurance, it, it does raise real questions as to what what a banking system looks like where the government has assumed all the risk. And um, that's just that's just a wholesale change in in how finance has been done in in the United States. And um, you know, and I agree with with Brian's comment. C Congress will and should take a longer, harder look at this before before jumping in. You know, and, and, and on that point, um, taking that longer look, um, I, I, policymakers at the regulatory bodies on the Hill, um, in academic circles, in the industry, I think people are going to step back from this and really start to question um, what had been, I think, commonly held assumptions about the fragility of the banking system. You know, it, it, if these you know, larger regional banks, but still regional banks. These are not the GSIBs. Um, they are. They have been subject to a lighter regulatory touch because it was assumed that um, uh, that they did not pose a systemic risk to the system. Um, it do, it raised a lot of questions about how we view the banking system as a whole and how fragile it is. And uh, th those are not questions that are easily answered. Um, and I think uh, policymakers and and kind of industry participants are going to be grappling that for, with that for a long time. I just just mentioned again, um, there's a real danger here of conflating symptom and problem, yep. right? We, we, we have an entirely economy that got oriented around a zero interest rate environment um, for a protracted period of time. And um, that kind of economy has all sorts of incentives and disincentives that everybody, including the financial system, oriented themselves around. Now, trying to normalize rates in such a short period of time back to, frankly, what has been historically normal, um, that is, is creating this shock. And we face a sort of an inflection point here in terms of do the policymakers really want to go back to a zero rate world? Is was that really healthy? Um, and getting out of that is going to be more costly than, than people anticipated. Are we willing to bear that cost to get to get to the other side? And uh, at the end of the day, you know, the interest rate, you know, a negative interest rate um, is a really uh, you could argue a really perverse thing, and it's it's sort of going the wrong direction. And the U.S. has always been a very productive and um, you know high energy place, and that means the interest rates need to be positive uh, to to reflect that fundamentally. And and so this there's there's there are big things here to be sorted out. Griff, I'm I'm going to go in a, a slightly different direction from the question because um, I think it was. It, um, it was the regulators broadly, um, but I, I think there's um, heightened risk for the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve system um, for many of the reasons that Chris was just citing. But when you, you know, the, the Fed's credibility has already has, was already deteriorating um, on capital. There have been past efforts to break up the Fed, to audit the Fed, a whole host of, 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 of different ideas. And there, it, it's never gotten traction. It's never 
gotten to, uh, enough mass, um, uh, critical uh, critical mass to move forward. Um, but the timing of this, the way that the Fed has contributed on the monetary side, the monetary policy side, the fact that it it apparently failed as a banking supervisor, throw in some of the scandals at the Federal Reserve System over the last couple of months with um, trading activities by Federal Reserve, uh, regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents, you're, you're starting to brew up a cocktail um, uh, that poses a lot of danger for the Federal Reserve. Um, I, we haven't, I haven't picked up a lot yet on break up the Fed um, uh, sentiments yet. Um, I don't think those are far, far away. All right, we have one more question. Um, given the time frame provided with congressional action, if any, creeping in the late spring or this summer, any chance that the bright banking crisis response gets tied up into the debt ceiling debate? You know, unfortunately, yes, um, because the debt limit, you know, the debt limit and then funding the government again at, at the end of the fiscal year, they're really the the, the two must pass things. And of course, the debt limit is really not a negotiable deadline. Uh, we will have exhausted all the extraordinary measures um, on the books by then. And so it could is this could be a real legislative train wreck. And um it could and and and, and as that approaches, people could see um, you can see attempts at people trying to maximize that opportunity um, and the byplay there, you know, it could get really messy. Yeah, I, I think the question is a great one because I think people, myself included, have been very focused on the near term and the immediate policy response, uh, the, the immediate political response. Um, but, um, you know, you're going to have a debt ceiling debate sometime in the summer, still don't know exact timing. Um, July, August, maybe into September, all, all fluctuating um, because the debt ceiling is a cash flow issue. Um, but it does raise the possibility, as, as Chris said, you know, attaching something to a must pass piece of legislation. Um, and so it, it's, it's too early to predict accurately or with confidence, um, but they're, they're definitely, it, it, the debt ceiling definitely provides a vehicle for some kind of, of policy response from, from Capitol Hill. Um, it also raises the risk associated with a failure to time, address the debt limit in a timely fashion, because we now see that the economy broadly, the banking system um, is not uh, as strong as we thought a couple of weeks ago. Um, we always knew that the debt ceiling debate um, posed a risk to the economy um, um, and to the markets, and as we saw in, in 2011 with um, very violent re uh, reactions in the equity markets in, in July of, of 2011. Um, but uh, if not handled properly, um, the risks have been raised because you now have a debt seal, a potential debt ceiling crisis married to what is right now a banking crisis, and we'll see where it goes next. I'd just follow up with, with two points uh, Brian just said. To the extent that the economy starts to deteriorate more rapidly than, than anyone anticipated, that'll put, that could pull the debt, the debt ceiling date closer. Um, so that, that's something to keep an eye on. And um, yeah, I mentioned, I used the word sort of stampede um, purposely because, um, you know, raising the deposit insurance limit could become a must pass thing or put another way, um, it, it could it could be one of those things that that rank and file members just can't vote against given given what's going on. So um, we, we could see that just take take off on its own as well depending on the dynamic. And, and you know, and, and to Chris's comment there on take on, on its own, these things tend to have a life of their own. Um, one, like I, I was alluding to before on um, changes in, um, in regulations, if there's a deposit insurance hike, um, once the process starts, very tough to control. It does take on a life of its own. You don't know where it's gonna wind up. 
you rem I just re re remember, uh, you know, these other, you know, when Dodd-Frank started to move, when, uh, when Sarbanes-Oxley started to move, the, these, these, the, these things take on a life of their own and things that you, you thought, oh, they'll never do that, uh, you know, gets, you know, 300 votes. Uh, so it's it the, the psychology here is is really important. Wouldn't you think that Congress had learned from their lessons in 2008, 2009 um, on how to respond to this? Like, it just seems like the time frame, you know, anyone who works with Congress knows it's going to take some time. Correct. But given the situation, if you're entering the spring or early summer and tying it to the debt ceiling debate, as you both described, we're talking a much longer process than would be anticipated. Well, one of the, I think, big untold stories about, you know, the, about Congress, at least in its current configuration, is the level of turnover. That's it. Is astounding. The number of, of members who were in Congress for Dodd-Frank um, is a rapidly narrowing group of people. So we have a, a whole cadre of folks um who are this is this is their first rodeo um and you know even since uh since covid uh big turnover uh, you know not as great but still a big turnover and so um there's a huge learning curve here for uh for rank and file members you know on 2155 i mean it, it's related to this part of the conversation you know uh, some people have said well you know it, it passed on bipartisan with bipartisan support there are a lot of democrats in the senate that voted for 2155 in 2018 there are a lot of democrats who voted for 2155 who are not there anymore and they have been replaced either by republicans with a populist tinge or they've been replaced by more progressive democrats and um uh you know um the populism that kind of is in Congress combined with the lack of institutional knowledge because of this turnover, um, you know, um, Griff, you were asking, you know, doesn't Congress learn? You know, some of Congress learns, but a lot of Congress leaves and the learning leaves with them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Worst case scenario, what if these institutions continue to collapse or need much needed help? Is there a last emergency situation where something gets done either by the regulators or Congress within the next few weeks? I think uh, if we were to see uh, just a, a, a rapid deterioration, uh, clearly the Fed pauses, but in extremists, it starts cutting rate, it starts cutting rates. And um, the, you know, all, all their objectives just sort of um, collapse on themselves, and um, if the system just is not um, liquid system wide, that 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 is the that is the biggest bazooka, so to speak. Uh, bad quote, but uh, that is the biggest gun that the that the Fed has, and um, to flood the system with liquidity as fast as it can, and and um, and revisit. Um, the kind of facilities that, you know, Dodd Frank has constrained their ability just to stand up things, um, and um, so it's inevitably going to have to involve Congress uh, yet again. Yeah, I, I, it, Congress's response will evolve as the situation evolves. Um, so what I tell clients is that where we are today, uh, a near-term response is very unlikely. Um, that changes if the facts change and the situation changes. So um, if the policy responses are not effective and um, you see you know, additional runs on some regional banks, and by the way, I, I think in, in many cases that probably has stabilized. Um, I think it was um, PacWest, I think, came out with a statement. I, I may have that wrong, but I, I think it's PacWest that came out with a statement on, on Friday night on, on, on their deposit flows. Um, which was which was positive, um, but if that's if industry wide um, things don't stabilize and things start to deteriorate, then Congress will step in. But 
again, kind of going back to some of the points we've been making, you know, the, the Fed's credibility has been hurt. Um, I would say that Secretary Yellen uh, could have a credibility problem going to the Hill and asking for emergency um, emergency responses after just telling lawmakers last week at the Senate Banking uh, Senate Finance Committee that um, the banking system is strong, resilient, the economy is strong. That, that's an amazing pivot to, for, a, for a, a Treasury Secretary to then go to the Hill and say, hey, by the way, I'm sorry, we, we need an emergency uh, uh, stopgap here. The, uh, I mentioned in, in, in my remarks earlier this, this notion of the information asymmetry and, um, and the stress tests. And you know, there's a, you know, a recent Nobel Prize on bank runs, and there's a Nobel Prize on, on, on information asymmetry. And you know, it really wasn't until those, the stress tests uh, were, were done and completed did the, the, the panic subside in the great financial crisis. And the longer that this remains just a mystery. I mean, markets hate um, um, the unknown and the more certainty that can be restored quickly. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's we're gonna have to see some more system-wide testing um, to clear the air here, just so people just know, oh yeah, it's safe to go back in the water. All right. Well, we're coming up on the hour, and I see some folks hopping off, unfortunately, um, but I know folks are busy. Before we leave, I just wanted to thank you to Ozzy Palomo and everyone at Chartwell Strategy who helps the New England Council with uh, hosting events and setting up events like this. Ozzy's a great guy, and if you're interested in learning more about the work that they do, uh, please feel free to reach out. But more importantly, sorry, Ozzy, thank you to Brian and Chris for their time today. Uh, you guys have done a great job. And uh, this has really been a good discussion on a tough topic, um, but your insights and experience is greatly appreciated. Thanks, Griff. Thanks, Chris. All right, Thanks, Ozzy. Take care. Have a great day, everyone. You too.